Well, hello everyone, and welcome to this uh, virtual session. My name is Ben Newton, uh, and I'm the general manager of the GE Oncology Solutions business at GE Healthcare. I'm going to be your host for the next 90 minutes or so, and I'm really glad that you could join us uh, and also sharing your time with us. In my role as uh, the head of uh, oncology, I'm focused on enabling doctors get the best possible uh, clinical outcomes for their patients. And what's really important in that uh, journey is, of course, that they get the right diagnosis and the right treatment. And if we can help them do that, then, of course, they'll get the best possible outcomes. So GE Healthcare Technology is, of course, used along the patient pathway from screening for disease in asymptomatic patients, from diagnosing disease in those patients who have symptoms, through to staging the disease and, of course, monitoring and, and hopefully following up uh, as they recover. Now, in this session, we're going to focus on theranostics. So that's the piece of the patient journey that combines diagnostics and therapy. And now theranostics is proving to be a crucial tool in the armamentarium of, of clinicians, in particular uh, molecular imaging specialists, to allow them to effectively personalize treatment for the patient. So we can match the diagnosis with a precise therapy. And in the cases that we're going to discuss later today, immunotherapy and radiotherapy. So before we get started, uh, I wanted to let you know that we'll be conducting a live polling uh, during the session today. So when it's time to poll, um, just take a look in the top right of your screen and you'll see a tab that says polling. Uh, all you need to do is to look out for the orange circle over the tab when it's time to conduct the poll and just follow the on-stream uh, instructions to provide your response. Once the poll's closed, um, the results from the poll um, will be uh, displayed in the same window. The results will be aggregated, so you'll be able to see uh, what the results were. We really encourage everyone to take part if it's possible, um, because we'd like to keep some engagement going, obviously some participation, but I think it's also gonna be interesting to see the results as well. So let's get started. So we're thrilled to have an absolutely impressive lineup of experts um, who are going to be speaking on this topic today. So to start, we've got Professor Rod Hicks and Dr. Simon Williams, who will be speaking on the future of precision diagnostics in the context of immunopets and immunopets role in uh, supporting precision therapies. We've got Professor Michael Kreisfeld, who will be presenting on SPEC principles and perspectives in theranostics. And thirdly, uh, Professor Caroline Goffin, who will be speaking on prostate cancer, and in particular, the role of PSMA PET in diagnosis and recurrence of, of prostate cancer. And finally, uh, we'll, we'll finish off the session with Professor Andre Iagaru, who will walk us through how to set up a clinic um, to help you get started with theranostics. So for me, this is a, just a fantastic roster of speakers, and um, I'm looking forward to get started. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our first speakers. So kicking off uh, the session is Professor Rod Hicks from the University of Melbourne in Australia, and Dr. Simon Williams from the Department of Biomedical Imaging in Genentech in the USA. Gentlemen, welcome. Thanks very much, Ben. Uh, it's a great pleasure for me to uh, join my colleague, Simon Williams, uh, to discuss our perspectives on the future of precision diagnostics, specifically with what I like to call immune PET, uh, because it's more than just the imaging of uh, labelled antibodies. These are my disclaimers. There's no doubt that immunotherapy has really revolutionised the management of several advanced and previously incurable cancers. The field has been dominated by two broad classes of agents, the anti-CTLA-4 and the anti-PDL-1 or PDL, uh, PD-1 antibodies. It's important to recognise that these two different classes of antibodies act on distinct immune checkpoints that suppress the immune response to cancer. There are both initiator and effector limbs of the immune response. Anti-CTLA-4 acts on the activation and proliferation of T cells, which then migrate to the tumour sites. And anti-PD-1 and PDL one agents act on the effector limb that kills uh, cells uh, and leads, hopefully, to tumour elimination. 
CD8 lymphocytes are important and in fact the main effectors of cancer immunity. I like to think of metastasis as being like a war with the Roman legions invading Gaul, which is defended by a ragbag of uh, players uh, in the immune system. There are collaborators like the immune suppressive T regulatory cells and myeloid derived suppressor cells and soldiers, the CD8 uh, uh, cells, uh, which armed with uh, weapons like Granzyme B kill the cancer cell. But just like uh, when uh, the Roman legions are attacked, cancer puts up barriers, and that main barrier is PDL1. And the anti PDL1 and PD1 agents act like obelisks with his mania to break down those barriers. In the early phases of a battle, as the soldiers move in, there's mayhem, and so it is with the immune system as the immune cells move in. And it's only when the dead and dying cells are cleared we can work out whether the war has been lost or won. In the case that it's won, where there's victory, uh, we call that early progression, uh, uh, in fact, pseudo-progression. And this has been confirmed pathologically by the demonstration of a high T-cell infiltrate and lack of viable tumour cells. However, this has made it very difficult to assess uh, response by our standard radiologic response criteria, and this has led to a plethora of modified response criteria which deal subtly differently with progressive disease uh, as indicated by enlargement of lesions or the development of new lesions. FDG-PET can help us in this, uh, particularly when we see a complete metabolic response, uh, as in this case. But in other cases, the response is much slower, even though it can be very durable. Where we run into problems and the major challenge is with this uh, uh, phenomenon of pseudo-progression, as seen with this left inguinal node, which is clearly enlarging and becoming more intense, uh, but eventually disappears. Or when there are some lesions which are uh, disappearing, but others which are appearing. So there's new lesions, but responding uh, target lesions. We've learnt with time to recognise certain patterns that help us with this uh, response where the primary lesions, the target lesions, are clearly responding as in this hepatic metastasis, but we're developing new lymph nodes in a draining draining lymphatic uh, basin. We can generally believe that this is probably part of pseudo-progression and and, an immune-related response. The challenges of uh, using FDG, however, are uh, exemplified by this series uh, produced uh, very nicely by my colleague uh, Amir Iravani um, and provided to me of a patient with left uh, auxiliary lymph nodes that were resected and irradiated, but subsequently the patient developed multifocal metastatic disease, as you can see here. The patient was started on an immune checkpoint inhibitor, uh, pembrolizumab, a PD-L, uh, PD-1 uh, agent, uh, and uh, on therapy there was some lesions that were clearly improving, others which were remaining stable, and some which were clearly progressing. The patient remained on this treatment with resolution of most of the sites of disease but persistence of activity in one liver lesion. Because the patient was generally well and and clinically responding, despite enlargement of this lesion, the patient remained on treatment uh, uh, and this uh, lesion remained uh, metabolically active and increased in size. And eventually the oncologist lost courage with uh, persisting with this therapy and and changed the patient over by adding a a CTL a uh, CTLA4 uh, agent and clearly this patient seemed to progress quite dramatically on that therapy, very uh, scary appearances, Uh, but the patient remained well and so the the therapy was uh, maintained and as you can see, uh, despite a persisting large lesion, almost a complete metabolic response and this patient went on to have uh, complete resolution of disease. While that's a wonderful uh, phenomenon, the pseudo-progression leading to to cure, uh, in some patients there's this secondary phenomenon called hyper-progression, as seen in this case, where there's an inexorable uh, and accelerated progression of disease, and unfortunately this patient uh, died uh, just a few weeks after that last scan. 
Uh, the rates of hyperprogression vary depending on the definition used from about f four or five percent up to around 30 percent and the mechanisms are increasingly understood but it is uh, associated with a very poor prognosis. And it's important to recognise, uh, as it's seen in this case of a patient treated with BRAF MEK inhibitors who initially responded, then became resistant to that treatment, was put on uh, combined epinevo, um, CTLA-4 and PD-1 therapy and showed this uh, hyperprogression uh, phenotype. But th that was stopped patient put back on a MEK inhibitor, a different combination, uh, and had an excellent response. So there's a narrow window of opportunity to change treatment modality. How do we use uh, or deal with this? There are certainly uh, very exciting developments in uh, evaluating the immune microenvironment. Uh, the imaging of CD8 uh, uh, lymphocytes, um, uh, uh, activated T cells, uh, radio-label antibodies, how we might use these is open to uh, some debate. I think there are potential roles in selecting the type of immune checkpoint inhibitors, differentiating between pseudo-progression, hyper-progression and understanding resistance. So what is the way forward? I think we need better imaging biomarkers to select patients for immune modulating therapies. FDG-PET is readily available, but as I've shown, uh, challenging to interpret in all but the cases of complete metabolic response. I believe that there's an unmet clinical need for uh, agents that identify when to stop, continue or modify treatment when there is clinical or radiologic progression. It is in the interest of both the clinical community and industry to develop and validate new diagnostic tools with immune PET uh, being an exciting option. And by immune PET, I, I mean the imaging tools that image the immune microenvironment. Uh, with that, I'm happy to uh, pass on uh, to uh, uh, Simon Williams for a discussion of one exciting agent in this regard. Thank you. So thanks very much to Rod Hicks for introducing the uh, concept of imaging in the management of cancer immunotherapy patients and the use of imaging as a biomarker um, in immunotherapy. And I am Simon Williams. I'm from the biomedical imaging department at Genentech. And um, I am not here by accident. The disclaimer is that Genentech and GE Healthcare are partnering on developing a clinical research imaging tool for cancer immunotherapy and autoimmune diseases. And from my perspective in um, drug development, we're not so much managing individual patients as managing a portfolio of novel drug candidates, trying to select the most promising of those to bring forward for future patients. And in this setting, we typically have clinical trials that are relatively small, uh, typically with uh, a large number of heavily pretreated patients. And so the drug link to uh, objective outcome is often unclear. And rather, we are trying to emphasize the drug link to its mechanism of action so that we can gain the confidence that the drug is working as expected to continue investing in that candidate and to bring it into full clinical development and eventually into market approval. And so when we start looking for these uh, biomarkers in such studies, we ask ourselves, is there already a suitable biomarker? Perhaps, perhaps there's already a perfectly acceptable imaging experiment or other biomarker uh, that will do that job for us. And failing that, perhaps we can um, adapt an existing tool or do some validation work to understand an existing tool and confirm its suitability. Uh, but there are times when we have to make a wholly new tool, perhaps, for example, this fluorine 18 interleukin 2 PET tracer from the UMCG group um, that was published earlier this year. When we want a new imaging tool, uh, we often turn to monoclonal antibodies to do that. Um, partly because there are many monoclonal antibodies already available, and perhaps because the monoclonal antibody in question is already the therapeutic, which means it's already available in GMP grade uh, for the imaging experiment, which makes life a lot easier. 
So, for example, we've been able to image the Konium 89 Atezolizumab with our colleagues in uh, the Netherlands at UMCG again, shown on the right. But even when they're engineered to have rapid plasma clearance, antibodies still have the large molecule property of being relatively slow to penetrate and to clear from tissues. And that inevitably pushes you into a multi-day imaging experiment. And to make that work, we typically have to radio label with something relatively long lived in terms of radioactive decay, very commonly zirconium 89. Zirconium 89 has a 3.3 day half life and about a 23% positron yield, which is good enough, should we say. It's uh, good but suboptimal for the PET imaging experiment. And perhaps more importantly for us, uh, it can complicate the use of uh, tissue harvest for parallel assays for pharmacokinetics, pharmacodynamics, and biopsies uh, for immunohistochemistry, for example. So to meet the challenges uh, that we've seen with imaging with zirconium-89 antibodies, uh, we've tried to develop a reagent that is based on radioisotope fluorine-18. On the top right, you can see images in a phantom, a chest phantom, uh, the same phantom imaged with fluorine-18 and with zirconium-89. This phantom sitting in my office at the moment, but it's quite clear that you can see uh, the lesions are more conspicuous and sharper in the fluorine-18 scan than the zirconium-89 scan at the same activity level. And so we're hoping that by switching to fluorine-18, we will simplify working with our clinical tissue samples. Uh, we will simplify the operational logistics um, by not having to do special supply arrangements for zirconium-89 and not needing special camera setup and such like. And these sharper images should bring us greater sensitivity to detect low levels of CD8, and we think that's important, and reduce radiation burden to the patient. And that's particularly interesting because we would like to be able to repeat the imaging uh, with the CD8 tracer at more time points, or perhaps to multiplex uh, by adding scans of uh, a different tracer, some orthogonal information from FDG or Granzyme B, for example. And to make this a reality, we've turned to llamas like Boris. And these camelids have antibodies, some of which are very like human IgG ones, uh, 150 kilodaltons, and some of which have interesting binding domains that are formed from a single protein chain around 12 to 14 kilodaltons. These can be recombinantly expressed and isolated as nanobodies or VHH domains. Um, and this combination of fluorine 18 and the VHH uh, gives us fast tissue kinetics with rapid tissue penetration and clearance. And that enables us to have a same day imaging experiment. And I'd like to acknowledge Hidi Plu and his lab uh, for pioneering some of these concepts. <clears throat> so our reagent VHH does not bind to mouse CD8, but we have performed many early experiments in mice carrying xenografts expressing human CD8. And so in these PET CT scans on the left, uh, there's a, a grayscale CT and a hot scale PET overlay. The circles are surrounding uh, a tumor, which is made up of a mixed population of CD8 negative Dowdy cells and CD8 positive HPB ALL cells. And at the end of the imaging experiment, uh, we can take the tumor out, disaggregate the tissue and count the CD8s by fax. And we've done this for a, a number of uh, different tumors, different proportions and uh, studied those and got what we think is quite an encouraging correlation between the PET signal on the y-axis and the CD8 content of the tissue on the x-axis. We can perform uh, experiments with a control reagent to help us assess selectivity and specificity of the CD8 binder as well. Here we have a control which is uh, nicely engineered just by reversing a pair of amino acids in the binding domain, which completely abrogates binding to CD8, but leaves most of the biophysical properties the same. So here in the, on the left, we have images from uh, a single scan session with a single mouse. First injection one on the left with the control reagent, where we can see uh, the 
VHH wash into and then wash out of the tumor very rapidly. And then second injection uh, with the CD8 binding VHH, where we can see the tracer wash into the tumor and stick. And these have been uh, some of the primary ways which we've assessed the tracer um, in, in the mouse models that we have accessible to us. The very similar experiments being performed where we're looking at the binding to natural T cells as opposed to lymphoma cells uh, in rhesus. And so here we have an experiment very similar in concept where we've imaged the control VHH and the CD8 binding VHH in the same subject twice. Not in the same scan session this time, that would be unacceptable for the animals to tolerate, um, but three days apart, so relatively close in time. So the left image is the control VHH, which shows you the uh, clearance pattern of the uh, VHH primarily through the kidneys. A little bit of gallbladder signal is evident as well. Uh, while the CD8 scan shows the same rapid clearance from the plasma, but the accumulation in CD8 rich normal tissues as well, uh, including particularly the, the head and neck lymph nodes are very obvious. The thymus is clear in this young animal, uh, the spleen, and the omentum, which was uh, a surprise to some. And on the right are time activity curves. For example, one of the axillary lymph nodes uh, top there showing that most of the binding is complete by about 20 minutes. After that, the improving contrast mostly comes as the result of a washout in the plasma. And you can see by the very uh, similar curve shapes for the control and binding VHH that the clearance is dominated by that renal clearance rather than binding to the spleen, lymph node or other CD8 rich normal tissues. And so we feel that this reagent is ready to go on for further clinical development. And we can imagine that this would be used in a good number of different indications uh, involving cancer immunotherapy um, because many, uh, <clears throat> many of these therapies converge on CD8 T effector cells as the modulators of cell death. And so we can imagine uh, studies with immune checkpoint inhibitors, as Rod has discussed, PD-1, CTLA-4, TIGIT, and so on, uh, or their combinations with radiation therapy, uh, phototherapy, chemotherapy, and others, or newer therapies like the tumor-targeted cytokines, or the immune modulators of the gas sting pathway, uh, Potentially, we could track uh, adopted, adopted T cells, therapeutic T cell transfer, such as the CAR Ts, or the T cells that are generated in response to cancer vaccines. So, there are certainly, many opportunities for further work here uh, if this reagent can be brought to the clinic. So, lastly, I'd just like to acknowledge my many colleagues and co workers and thank them for their valuable contributions to this project. Uh, which we look forward to coming to fruition soon. Thanks very much, uh, Simon. That was really exciting data, and I'm certainly incredibly excited about the uh, the future of immune pet uh, in all its various potential manifestations for improving the way we select and uh, monitor the, the treatment with immune checkpoint inhibitors. And it's it's really exciting uh, era that we're entering into. Thank you. Gentlemen, thanks so much for such a, a fantastic um, presentation. Um, I, I think it's really important to remember that while FDG PET is, uh, of course, really useful um, in, in using, in, in being able to monitor responses to cancer immunotherapies, and of course, it's widely available, there are some challenges in interpreting um, the results, particularly those early patient responses. Uh, it, it also has limited utility in, in obviously selecting the optimal type of immunotherapy. So deciding which immunotherapy to, to use, uh, PET FDG is not necessarily going to help. And this is why I think, as we heard, the use of um, uh, immunopet to help uh, select patients for the right immunotherapy or select the right therapies for the right patients is going to be um, important in the future. And in that regard, selecting the th right therapy, of course, gives us a better chance of getting the right outcomes. And of course, the right outcomes 
is going to be important for the patient especially, but also in terms of, uh, of cost savings as well. So when you think about CD8 PET and, a, and its use in potentially selecting immunotherapy drugs, um, its applications are more than simply around clinical management. It could also be used in selecting therapies that are being developed too. So utility in clinical trials could be an enormous um, uh, application for this type of technology in the future. So we'll wait and see uh, what happens in that regard. So before we move on to the next speaker, let's just pause a second and conduct our first poll. So the first question we have is, which of the following statements best describes your organization experience with Theranostics? And the responses could be, A, what is Theranostics? B, we're just starting to explore formalizing a Theranostics approach in our institution. Or C, we're currently in the process of building or formalizing a Theranostics approach. Or D, we have a fully established Theranostics approach up and running. Or E, none of the above. So now we're going to shift gears a little and we're going to hear from Dr. Michael Kreisel. Um, Dr. Kreisel is the professor of nuclear medicine at the Otto von Guericke University in Magdeburg, Germany. And he's going to talk to us about spec principles and his perspectives on theranostics. So, Professor Kreisel, over to you. Thank you for the kind introduction, Ben. Uh, I am very happy to be here and uh, I want to thank GE for inviting me to give this talk to you right now. The title of the talk will be The Place of SPECT in Theranostics. And the second slide will be the disclosure and disclaimer slide. And then I will continue with the old history of Theranostics with SPECT. And then go into more detail about SPECT. Why is it important for Theranostics today uh, in terms of selecting patients, in terms of restaging during radioligand therapy? in terms of verification of radioligand distribution and uh, last but not least dosimetry as well. So Theranostics is not uh, a new thing actually. Um, Theranostics using radioiodine has been done already for 80 years and still is being done uh, quite frequently about 60,000 treatments uh, in Germany uh, so this is a, a very long uh, period of time, actually. And of course, uh, iodine is very well suited for theranostics because you have, first of all, several uh, radioisotopes which you can use, namely iodine-123, but also iodine-131. And you actually don't have to radiolabel. You can just use them and... Uh, to, in order to image the target, which is the sodium iodine supporter on thyroid uh, cells or thyroid cancer cells. Um, interestingly enough, though, is that, uh, at least according to my literature research, uh, SPECT was not that uh, early used in terms of uh, uh, imaging iodine-31 in thyroid cancer but it was more used for imaging MIBG distribution. Um, like in this paper on the top in 1985, where uh, the distribution of iodine-123 um, was uh, visualized using SPECT in patients with pheochromosatoma, but also in order to image the normal, normal adrenal medulla. Actually, one year later, a case report was published imaging iodine-131 in a carcinoid tumor. So this was the earliest report I could find, but I might be wrong, though. Uh, the history of SPECT is a quite a long history. Of course, um, it started with the uh, invention of the gamma camera, and then uh, quite early on, the first SPECT system uh, was actually described. In the beginning, in some cases, uh, patient was turning but not the uh, but not the camera later on of course the the detector heads were turning and as you can see in this nice uh, summary by Hutton et al 
uh, there was a steady development to newer and newer technologies uh, with uh, the CZT technology being introduced about 10 years ago and about five years ago for the full uh, size gamma cameras. So why use SPECT in Theranostics today? Um, PET is so much better, as you all know, at least in, in terms of uh, resolution, but also in terms of sensitivity. However, I think there is definitely a place for SPECT in Theranostics. First of all, SPECT, when you select patients for radioligand therapy, is more available. Uh, gamma cameras are more widely distributed, especially in uh, less developed countries as well. Then also uh, spec traces usually have a longer half-life and you can produce those spec traces centrally and ship them to several locations where they can then can be used. And uh, thirdly, in order to assure or be, be sure that the, the target is present uh, in a patient, for example, uh, that there is PSMA expression, you don't necessarily need a high uh, resolution system. Um, you just need to make sure that you can actually see the tumor and that you can assess uh, if there is a tracer uptake, yes or no. In terms of restaging during ligand therapy, I want to illustrate this uh, with a uh, two examples. This, so this is an unfortunate young late, lady, 20 years old, 21 years old, with small bowel, uh, neuroendocrine neoplasia, and bone, uh, lymph node, and lung metastasis. And you can see the uh, PET projection on the left side uh, with uh, multiple metastases. And uh, because of uh, the widespread disease, um, he chose to perform radiopeptide therapy in this patient. And uh, in the middle image, you can see the post-therapeutic um, scan performed, which is basically the same as the PET, but lower resolution. But on the second scan, you already can see that there is actually a response to the treatment. and There are fewer lesions with, with only one big lesion in the chest visible. Uh, because of the very good response to those two cycles, we chose to then not continue the treatment, but wait. And uh, we are actually right to wait in this patient because at the end of the year, so after about eight months, there was a complete remission on the PET. This is a second uh, case of a 69-year-old male with a castrate refractory uh, prostate uh, cancer with a lymph node metastasis marked here with the red, uh, red arrows, uh, bone metastasis as well, and also liver metastasis. Um, but during the staging prior to radioligand therapy, there was also a lesion seen in the chest which did not show any PSMA expression. And this lesion then was uh, further evaluated and proved to be lung cancer. So the patient were first received surgery for the lung cancer and then was referred to radioligand therapy for the prostate cancer four months later. Uh, during those four months, however, uh, the PSA increased and uh, as you can see on the post-therapeutic imaging, um, there is massive progression, especially with a widespread uh, liver um, metastasis, but also progressing lymph node metastasis. So this imaging can serve as a, basically the new baseline for the further um, imaging conducted uh, in, in the context of the radioligand therapy. Um, another important aspect of SPECT in Theranostics is the verification of radioligand distribution. In Germany, we are obliged to do so. Um, and uh, uh, this is an important part of the post-therapeutic imaging. So this is again a prostate cancer patient uh, after surgery, after radiation therapy, after also lymph node surgery, but then re relapsing again with um, uh, irresectable um, tumor lesions in the pelvis, very small but irresectable. One lesion uh, 
frontal to the uh, sacrum and another lesion uh, next to the rectum, basically. So um, this patient then um, was referred to radioligand therapy at his own wish. He's a medical doctor and oncologist. And um, the, this was then the uh, post-therapeutic imaging, which looks not very spectacular. Uh, so there is uptake uh, in the liver, in the kidneys, and all in the large bowel as well. And possible uptake also in the presacral lesion if you have a look at the dorsal views. However, you cannot be sure. And in order to be sure, of course, we performed uh, SPECT CT. And indeed, the lesion uh, uh, ventral to the sacrum uh, showed a very strong uptake of the tracer. We then also checked the second lesion um, and could not really find the second lesion uh, next to the rectum. There was one uh, spot of increased uptake within actually the, the rectum, uh, likely due to the movement of the rectum. This could, could be the, the, the small lymph node. Um, however, the problem with the SPECT is that usually the SPECT, uh, one bed of, of you takes at, at least 15, 20 minutes minimum. So there's definitely a need uh, for uh, speed, for uh, speeding up the SPECT. And uh, in order to have less motion artifacts and also to have a higher throughput in terms of patient numbers, but also a higher throughput in terms of the area covered. By the, by the spec. And of course, uh, this need for speed also goes uh, hand in hand with the need for new, newer technologies or newer technology, as you can see here. Um, one of those new technologies for sure is CZT imaging. Um, we are proud to have uh, received the first system in Europe uh, in Magdeburg. Um, and uh, we went to experience the exceptional energy resolution and uh, also appreciate the, the high spatial resolution and the high sensitivity. However, uh, at least the first versions of the system um, have, a, have a problem in terms of imaging higher energy uh, radionuclides. Um, so, um, suitability for iodine imaging, but also uh, lutetium imaging is limited, uh, at least with the current system. However, that uh, uh, problem seems to be solved, at least for the lutetium imaging. There's a new medium energy high resolution collimator uh, already established for the system. And there has been already some research conducted with this uh, collimator and uh, in this, uh, like in, in this group of authors, they showed last year at the um, um, meeting of the American Society of Nuclear Medicine that uh, the quantitation using this new collimator uh, and CZT is at least as good as uh, using sodium iodine uh, system. And uh, they also found that there's a higher count rate which can be indicative of a higher sensitivity of the system with the medium energy collimator and CZT compared to the sodium iron system and uh, also a medium energy um, collimator. One of the most important uh, aspects of SPECT uh, in theranostics is dosimetry. Also, here we are obliged in Germany to perform dosimetry. And uh, in Magdeburg, we actually use uh, on a regular basis the uh, GE dosimetry toolbox uh, and are very happy with it. Um, this is an example of a neuroendocrine tumor patient with a, um, to, uh, with a metastasis uh, to the liver. Uh, we perform planar images at uh, about five time points. And in addition to planar imaging, we also add SPECT CT at one time point and then again use the toolbox in order to segment out the organs at risk, but also the metastasis and to calculate tumor doses. And uh, we have uh, published this approach and uh, 
this uh, kind of dosimetry, of course, works very well. Um, however, there's, I think, a lot more to expect in the future, um, especially faster image acquisitions using newer technology spec CT systems. Uh, there will be definitely more automation and uh, there will be also artificial intelligence involved in the future, both in terms of getting better resolution images during dosimetry, but moreover also uh, getting uh, better data analysis and faster uh, analysis of the data. So I'm very excited to see the future developments. There are already some papers out, as you can see, and uh, we will see what the future will show. I'm sure the future will be very bright. And at this time, um, I come to the end of my talk. Thank you very much uh, for your attention. Uh, I will be very happy to see you uh, uh, in live again. I hope during the next meeting. And I wish us all a very nice and interesting GE meeting. Thank you very much. So fa fantastic presentation. Thanks so much, um, Professor Kreisel. Um, I, I really, really like the point uh, about the use of SPECT in, in Theranostics and um, particularly the fact that we're um, really revitalizing what is a pretty old procedure, really. Um, but using technologies like CZT and AI, it's making SPECT imaging a key companion in, in, in the growth of, of Theranostics, clearly useful uh, technology as we move forward. But before we um, go to our next speaker, I really want to do another poll. And um, and that next poll is focused on um, some GE products. So in fact, the most recently announced GE products um, uh, that we have in, in, in MI. And which of those products interest you most is the question. So let's start with A, and that is MyoSpec, uh, cardiac dedicated spec. If that's your most interesting I mean, if that's the product that you're most interested in, tick that. Starguide Spec CT, uh, tick that if that's uh, your most uh, uh, your highest interest product. Uh, C is Discovery MI Gen Two, Thirty uh, CM Six Ring Pet CT, and D is Estratet Radio Pharmaceutical, and, and E, which uh, is probably my favourite, is uh, is Fast Lab Two, uh, the multi tracer uh, pet manufacturing platform. So please um, uh, fill in your answers uh, to those uh, questions there. Thank you. So now I'd like to introduce our next speaker. Professor Caroline Goffin is the vice chair of the EANM Oncology and Theranostics Committee. And she also leads the nuclear medicine clinical and research programs at the University Hospital in Leuven in Belgium. Professor Goffin is gonna be talking to us about prostate cancer and in particular, the role of PSMA PEC in diagnosis and recurrence of prostate cancer. So welcome, Professor Goffin, over to you. Thank you, Ben. Good day, dear colleagues. I'm Caroline Goffin, and it's my honor today to talk to you about the role of PSMA PET imaging in prostate cancer. During the disease course of a patient with prostate cancer, there are several clinical scenarios in which PSMA PET imaging may be useful. In the next 20 minutes, I will go through the main clinical indications with you, starting with primary staging. Then we'll move to biochemical recurrence, which was actually the stage in which the PSMA uh, story really started. Then we will move on to the role of PSMA PET for treatment follow-up. And we will conclude with some words on the role of PSMA PET imaging for the selection of patients for PSMA-based radioligand therapy and for treatment follow-up of this treatment. So let's start with primary staging. I'm sure that you're all aware of the pivotal trial that was published in 2020 by Hoffman and colleagues and that compared PSMA PET imaging to conventional staging uh, for patients with high-risk primary prostate cancer. In this pr uh, prospective trial, uh, Hoffman and colleagues were able to show that the accuracy of PSMA PET uh, to identify um, metastatic lymph nodes as well as bone metastases was significantly higher compared to um, conventional imaging. And this difference was mainly caused by a much higher sensitivity for PSMA PET compared to conventional uh, imaging. 
In this study of Hoffman and colleagues, they used PSMA PET-CT as a hybrid imaging modality. But apart from PET-CT, we also have different hybrid imaging modal modalities avail available to us. For example, PET-MRI. If we look at the individual strengths and weaknesses of PET and MRI, we know that PET allows in vivo quantitative molecular imaging of, bi of biological processes with a very high sensitivity, but it lacks a little bit in anatomical reference. MRI, on the other hand, allows for in vivo structural, functional and molecular imaging of biological processes with a very high spatial resolution and also high tissue contrast. If we combine the two modalities into one hybrid modality, as we have available in PET-MRI systems, we can theoretically end up with an almost perfect circle. If you, however, look at this perfect circle and compare it to our daily clinical routine, you may notice that, for example, clinical availability is currently not as high as it was uh, depicted in this theoretical model. We have PET-MRI systems uh, available, but they are not as widely available as PET-CT. If we look at the potential role and use of PSMA PET-MRI in primary prostate cancer staging, and we focus on local staging, um, it was already described quite early in the PSMA PET era that PSMA PET-MRI is an excellent tool to visualize the primary prostate cancer lesion and that the detection rate is actually significantly higher when you use PSMA PET-MRI compared to standard uh, standalone multi-parametric MRI. Also, if you, also, when you compare uh, the uptake uh, to histology, it was shown that the accuracy of PSMA PET-MRI was significantly better than that of PET and of multi-parametric MRI alone. And you can see an example here on the right, where you can clearly see the intense focal uptake in the prostate cancer lesion itself. You can also see the changes that can be seen on the multiparametric MRI. And if you combine these two together, you get an optimal detection of your primary prostate cancer lesions. These early findings were then later confirmed by other studies and were recently nicely put together in a uh, literature overview that was published by Laura Evangelista in the European, European Journal of Nuclear Medicine in, uh, just this year, uh, which concluded that PET-MRI using PSMA has greater diagnostic value in loca locating prostate cancer compared to MRI or PET imaging alone. Again, also depicted here in the, in the figure, if you see intense PSMA uptake on PET and you see typical changes on multiparametric MRI, you're quite sure that you have detected the dominant prostate cancer lesion in your image. Also, when you're uh, applying more advanced image uh, processing, uh, the use uh, of the two modalities together offers um, uh, pot uh, extra potential. In this study, um, the authors have constructed a model to try to predict the Gleason score um, using either uh, an, uh, um, parameters based on the single modality or uh, using hybrid modality. And you can see from the table that when you use the information of PET together with the information of MRI, you get the highest accuracy in predicting the Gleason score in the lesion. Um, also, um, for the detection of extracapsular extension and seminal vesicle infiltration, which are two factors that are important in treatment decisions and that can distinguish, help distinguish aggressive from indolent disease, you can see from the ROC curves that the use of PET-MRI uh, is more accurate in detecting these um, pathological features than just use of a multi-parametric MRI alone. Uh, and an example of this extracapsular extension in a patient with primary prostate cancer can be seen in this figure as well. Moving to the second clinical scenario, which is a scenario of biochemical recurrence, um, which is, as, I, of, as I've already mentioned, the really the beginning of the PSMA story in prostate cancer. 
I have put together three of the studies, the larger studies that have been uh, published in this clinical uh, scenario, two with gallium PSMA 11 as radioligand and then one with F18 PSMA 1007, which is one of the uh, compounds that we have currently, uh, F18 labeled compounds that we have currently available for PSMA imaging. When you look at the detection rate of these studies, you see that they are more or less similar and somewhere between 80 and 90 percent. What is also very clear from uh, these studies is that there is a correlation between the detection rate and the PSA value at the time of the scan, where you see that when you have higher PSA values, you have reach uh, the detection rate goes up to almost 100%. But also when patients still have lower PSA values below uh, 0.5, the detection rate is still somewhere between 50 and 60%. Can you also use PET-MRI in, uh, in patients with biochemical recurrence? Definitely. Uh, it has been shown that uh, PET-MRI has a similarly high diagnostic performance with very low overall discrepancy in PET-positive findings. And the use of PSMA PET-MRI may uh, specifically be useful when you're using gallium PSMA 11 because then you will be able to more accurately detect local recurrences, which may be uh, disguised by the physiological tracer accumulation in the bladder, uh, which is uh, very well known for this, uh, for this radio tracer. PET-MRI also offers a slightly higher detection rate for lymph node metastases, and it also can detect bone metastases very well, although there's no clear benefit um, from the published literature uh, over PET-CT. So overall, PSMA PET-MRI is an excellent imaging modality to uh, image your patients with biochemical recurrence, as is PET-CT. When we move on in the disease course of the patients uh, and we look at the value of uh, PSMA PET when patients have metastatic castration-resistant prostate cancer and will be um, receiving different systemic treatments, um, we can see that indeed also in this scenario, PSMA PET may be uh, very useful. Um, there are some studies that looked into this and I have just selected a couple of them. Um, this first study is from the group in Brussels and they compared the PSMA expression changes when patients are under novel androgen drug treatment. This can be abiraterone or enzalutamide. Uh, and they were able to show that the changes that, were able, that they were able to measure with PSMA are associated with the conventional response criteria that we, uh, that we have. There are some examples here on the bottom of patients that show a very good or even complete response, and then patients that are identified as non-responders and show stable disease or progressive disease on the, uh, on the administered systemic drugs. In this next study, the authors correlated the response that was measured using PET with the response that they uh, measured using biochemical uh, response parameters, and this is mainly PSA. And they were able to show that in two-thirds of the patients, there was a um, good uh, correlation or compatible response, whether you use biochemical parameters or imaging. In one third of, a patient, of the patients, there were discrepant findings between imaging and the biochemical response. And as you can see from the graph, this was mainly uh, the, the case in patients that have a biochemical stable disease, where um, more than 90% of the patients were reclassified into either um, improvement, so response based on PET or progressive disease. In the other two uh, biochemical response groups, the number of patients that were reclassified based on imaging were, uh, were present, but this was lower. Now, what is the relevance of using imaging uh, for response assessment in this uh, setting? Uh, your imaging modality will be able to show you um, individual lesions and assess individual lesions in cases of heterogeneous lesion responses. It can also reveal the appearance of new lesions. And um, also important, it can, it can identify lesions that require special consideration, for example, radiotherapy or pathological fractures that, uh, that need uh, treatment. 
In a final study that I selected, uh, the authors uh, correlated um, the changes that were seen on PSMA PET to outcome measures. Um, as a response criterion for PET, they used the decrease uh, of SUV max of the prostate cancer lesions, and they were able to show that in patients that have a higher decrease in SUV max, um, the time to therapy change, but also the overall survival is better than if in patients that only had a small or no decrease in the SUV max. So uh, I believe that PSMA PET is, an, is a very promising tool for treatment response assessment in the MCRPC setting, but there are some difficulties that we still have to uh, tackle. As you also may have seen in the previous studies that I've shown you, uh, the criteria that are used to identify a response on PSMA imaging were different. Uh, and these are just three examples, but there are actually many more uh, potential response criteria that you could use. Uh, and at the moment, we're not sure which uh, response criteria are best and whether these response criteria can be applied to all the different therapies that are uh, currently available to patients in MCRPC setting. Um, in an effort to try to uh, solve this issue, uh, there have been two um, sets of response criteria published. On the one hand, there are the PPP criteria. These are basically progression criteria. Um, and there are no um, criteria for response defined in this system. On the other hand, there are the EAU EANM working group criteria, where um, uh, there are criteria for response uh, defined, uh, together with, uh, with criteria for stable disease and progressive disease. And moreover, in the category of progressive disease, there is a distinction between the criteria that should be used in patients with early recurrent prostate cancer compared to patients that are in a more advanced polymetastatic state. So to conclude some words about the role of PSMA PET imaging for the selection of patients for PSMA-based radioligand therapy. Currently, patient selection for PSMA-based radioligand therapy is based on the PSMA uptake of lesions, and most groups are using gallium PSMA-11 uptake in lesions and compare it to the physiological background uptake in the liver. It is currently not very not clear how the F18 labeled PSMA compounds can be used for patient selection, since these compounds are known to have a much higher physiological liver uptake. So we need some more work to figure out how we can actually use also these F18 labeled compounds to correctly select patients for PSMA based therapy. Um, in this uh, nomogram that was published very recently by the group of Cafita and co-authors, you can see how we can use PSMA PET imaging uh, to really identify the best patients we want to treat with PSMA radioligand therapy. Um, based on the nomogram, they were able to uh, distinguish patients into a high-risk group or a low-risk group. And as you can see from the survival curve, the overall survival was much was better in the group uh, with uh, low risk based on the nomogram compared to high risk. If we look at the parameters that were used in the nomogram, you see that there are four uh, parameters that are based on the imaging that we perform prior to patient selection. Tumor uh, SUV values are taken into account as well as the number of lesions that are seen on the PSMA PET scan, together with the presence or absence of bone and liver metastases. Apart from PSMA imaging for patient selection, it may also be useful to combine PSMA imaging with FDG um, in a kind of a dual tracer imaging protocol. Why is this interesting or potentially interesting? Um, the group of Michalski and co-authors have shown that when patients have at least one lesion, that is FDG avid and PSMA negative, so a mismatch lesion, that the overall survival in these patients is actually uh, significantly worse than in patients that do not have these kind of mis mismatch uh, lesions. So definitely worth uh, taking into account uh, whether it's uh, useful to also combine the PSMA with FDG imaging in this setting. 
PSMA PET can also rely reliably be used for response assessment in MCRPC patients that are undergoing PSMA based therapy. Um, as in the uh, previous uh, treatment response chapter that we discussed, uh, also in this clinical scenario, the use of PSMA PET may overcome limitations of resist that we have in prostate cancer. Again, it is a question which response criteria we should use. And again, I show you another measure that you could use and that could be of interest. In this study, they evaluated uh, the change in the total tumor volume, which was uh, semi-automatically uh, delineated uh, using a software tool. Uh, and this total, to total tumor volume, which really gives you an idea about the total disease burden that the patient has, um, can be followed up in a second scan after a number of cycles in, of, uh, of PSMA therapy. Here you can see that the total, total tumor volume has decreased very strongly after three cycles of radioligand therapy. And the others were also able to, to show that the change in this total tumor volume is associated to overall survival, as you can see here in the uh, uh, survival, survival curve here on the right. Again, another system that is, uh, has been described with good correlation to the uh, overall survival is a modified PPP criteria system, where not only the imaging is taken into account, but also biochemical response parameters are used, such as PSA. Uh, and we're also using this system. Indeed, the authors are able to discriminate patients with, um, with better and uh, worse overall survival uh, when uh, being identified as progressive or non-progressive using these uh, criteria. So to conclude, I have some take-home messages for you. I think in primary staging, PSMA PET is a suitable replacement for conventional primary imaging in high-risk prostate cancer patients. And PSMA PET MRI is a very useful imaging technique in this clinical scenario. In biochemical recurrence, PSMA PET is the imaging modality of choice and is in that way also integrated into the current clinical guidelines. For response assessment in the MCRPC setting, I think the use of PSMA PET is promising, but we need further work on standardization and validation of, these, of the response criteria uh, that we will use. And then for PSMA-based radioligand therapy, PSMA PET is mandatory to select patients for PSMA-based radioligand therapy based on the theranostic principles, and it may also in this scenario be a suitable tool for response assessment and potential OS prediction. With this, I want to thank you very much for your attention and wish you a very pleasant day. And now it's time for our final speaker. I have the honor uh, of introducing Dr. Andre Iagaru, a professor of radiology and nuclear medicine and is also Chief of the Division of Nuclear Medicine and Molecular Imaging at Stanford Healthcare in Palo Alto in California. Professor Aguru is going to be sharing how he set up his clinic for Theranostics and how it's developed and how it's used to both treat and of course diagnose patients. So over to you Professor, welcome and thank you. Hi everyone, I want to thank the organizers for the invitation to present in this forum. Also want to acknowledge the excellent speakers ahead of me and uh, an honor to be in your company. Today I will talk to you about how to get your clinic ready for a Terranostics approach. I'm Andre Agar in Nuclear Medicine at Stanford. What I'm going to show you in the next uh, few slides worked for us and I acknowledge that it may not work for everyone, but I hope that at the end of this presentation you will get a few ideas that will help you on the pathway to a Terranostics approach. I put this disclaimer, please read it. So let's start first, you may have noticed the G in black in the otherwise uh, red font on my first slide. Uh, I want to clarify things. I think that if we uh, listen to the experts in uh, Greek, in linguistics, Theranostics is the better term with a G and hopefully this will settle it. Uh, jokes aside, I don't think it's such a big deal, but I do prefer spelling it with a G. So how do we get to a Theranostic Center? I think it helps to have a corporate memory. And what do I mean by this? I was fortunate, like my colleagues, to train with experts like Michael Goris in uh, 
antibody therapies, and Ross McDougall in thyroid cancer. Ross had the largest clinic in the U.S. with more than 5,000 thyroid cancer patients, and he still reached out by patients to, for advice. This is just one slide showing one of the many contributions by Dr. Goris on the left, a labeled antibody injected without cold antibody. All you can see is spleen and liver and bone marrow. On the right, the same patient with antibody given as cold antibody, and now all of, you, all of a sudden you can see the lymphoma in the right axilla, in the retroperitoneum, and right pelvis. But probably the most important asset are visionaries. We were fortunate to have two. Dr. Gary Glazer, who was the chair from 1989 to 2011, had the vision of creating molecular imaging at Stanford. And so he recruited Sam, who was the chair from 2011 and 2020, and before that, the head of nuclear medicine from 2003 to 2011. Sam had a vision for molecular imaging when these words were just some distant talk for the rest of us. Sam's vision for nuclear medicine included the creation of the radiochemistry facility, the Clark Center that houses the largest preclinical imaging facility in the world, as well as a new space for nuclear medicine. And although he joined in 2003, it took him seven years to get to fruition this new clinical nuclear medicine space. And this is a picture taken at the opening in October 2010. We knew immediately that a few years later we will need to start planning for the next phase, for the next decade, because things take time. So this is what I think is the formula for success. You need space, which means money. You need equipment. You need collaborations. And probably the most important, certainly the most important, you need people. So let's go through this one by one, starting with space. What I learned is that you need to prepare a business plan to go to your hospital administrators, and this will include the cost of design, the cost of construction, the cost of equipment, but also the cost of personnel, physicians, nurse practitioner or nurse, radiochemist, radiopharmacist, technologist, medical assistant, perhaps others. You need to have a project manager, someone who will drive this project. You will not have the time to be the one at the front all the time. You also need to have a very good working relationship with hospital executives and those who hold the money. And also accept that you will not win all the time. So that can be rephrased as compromising when you see defeat on the horizon. Arm yourself with persistence and be patient. This will take many years to go from a plan to fruition. This is our clinic, a schematic on the left. Uh, we see the uh, PET CTs on one side, SPEC CTs on the other, highlighted in red was the physics lab. In 2015, we saw that that may be a good space for Terranostics. We had an architect do some drawings, and then once we secured funding, we had the architectural design. This including uh, input from patients because we wanted this to be as patient-centric as possible. And briefly, just with the various stages of construction, this construction happened without shutting down our clinic, although it's across the hallway from the scanners and the reading room. Everything was gutted down to the studs, so we started fresh demo after demolition of the physics lab, as well as the creation of a few new restrooms. These are different phases to the construction. Again, it takes patience to have everything done, and then you need to be inspected by the state authorities. This is prior to opening, when we are still installing furniture, and uh, happy to say that um, in May of this year, we opened and we are seeing patients on a daily basis now in these four rooms. Well, this doesn't stop there. What do you do about inpatient diagnostics? On the left, we have the new building that opened in 2019. Address is 500 Pasteur Drive, which means that the building that opened in 1989 was deemed obsolete. So now it's being renovated. Again, everything is shut down to the core new walls, new everything. And fortunately for us, this means that we can have space for inpatient diagnostics for remodeled rooms. And these are drawings on the left showing, in fact, this window. It's a window to one of the diagnostics rooms on the first floor. There are also two on the ground floor, and one of them will have enough lead in the walls to allow us to do high activity iodine on 31, as in iodine on 31 MIBG. And for those of you who visited Stanford, you may recognize the entrance to the old building now with some new architectural changes. And if you visit us, we are here on the second floor and right next door to the new cancer hospital. So very good location for these therapy rooms. This is an architectural plan for the two rooms on the ground floor. 
one is heavily lead shielded, the other one less so. They're both placed on an oncology floor, so when not in use for our patients, this will be used for other oncological patients. And this is on the first floor, one room above the heavy line, lead line one, and the rest of them are medical oncology rooms with oncology nursing, which I think will be beneficial for us for treating these patients. We're also expanding our radiochemistry facility. This is the Terranos building. We hope to turn bad blood into good blood. Work has started to build a second cyclotron facility. And this is how it looks like in schematics. This is a solid target recyclotron with multiple hot cells as well as rooms for alpha labeling and beta labeling. So this will allow uh, the conduction of multiple new therapy trials. Equipment is important, and I will run through some of the ones that we use. We are fortunate to be able to install four Cigna PET MRIs since December 2013, including the first one worldwide. We have proved that you can image very fast. I would argue that one minute per bed produces high image quality for PSMA 11 when others recommend three or four minutes. And for other radiopharmaceuticals such as RM2, labeled with gallium-68, probably two minutes per bed is sufficient as well. So how does this tie into diagnostics? We have trials where we can guide biopsy first. This is one of them, randomizing patients to PSMA11 or RM2. This example in panel E, needle tracks where the cancer was missed. The cancer is highlighted in red on the top row, faint uptake with PSMA on the bottom row, focal uptake with RM2, and 3D rendering in panel F showing the presence of cancer, which matches precisely the RM2 uptake. We're also guiding high-intensity focus ultrasound using the same method, PSMA11 and or RM2, and we repeat this scan six months later to see if we can eliminate the need for a biopsy to document the response to treatment. Panel A in green needle tracks where there was no cancer, in red where you had clinically significant cancer. Panel B, we see the same area with focal uptake of RM2 before treatment, and then in panel D, uh, with PSMA, with uptake as well. After HIFU, six months later, no uptake, uh, no need for biopsy. This was, in fact, biopsy that turned out to be no disease. But if the trends continue, perhaps some of these men will not need an invasive biopsy. We do the same for high-dose rate brachytherapy. In the top panel, PSMA, six months after treating the lesion that is seen in the bottom line, uh, in this case, as I mentioned, with radiation therapy. Same thing with bombesine with gallium-68 RM2 on the left prior to brachytherapy, focal uptake in the prostate gland after high-dose rate brachytherapy, lack of signal. This man did not have a re residual disease on biopsy. PET-CT, it's another tool in our armamentarium, and we are moving in the direction of all digital. We'll be there soon. Again, we can scan very fast. We can also identify new niches. In this case, the Theranostics post uh, selective internal radiotherapy for liver disease. On the top, a 10-minute acquisition the next day after yttrium-90 surge spheres. On the bottom, the corresponding FDG that was used to plan the treatment. And with standard scanners, you need up to 45 minutes for one bed. We've shown in this publication that five or even 10 minutes are sufficient for the dosimetry purposes, and more than 90% of livers fit in one bed. Also for low counts, such as zirconium-89 panitumab, the top row five um, days after injection, you have high image quality, increasing the specificity over the standard of care FDG, in this case for squamous cell cancer in the head and neck. Very exciting developments as far as equipment in the spec CT area as well. We are going in the direction of uh, CZT on all fronts. So I will talk first about the uh, Discovery 870 CZT. Uh, we introduced this at uh, our institution last year, and this is an example for a Theranostics use. Uh, on the left, we have a Gallium-68.8 uh, PET, and on the right, uh, immediately after infusion of the Lutatera, we wanted to document the presence of treatment in the areas of known disease in the liver. These are high-quality images here noted on uh, transaxial spec CT and fused PET CT. What the 870 CCT allows us is to go into applications that were difficult before. Here is a patient uh, with uh, osteosarcoma with extensive uh, metastasis in the thorax that we decided to treat with Sofigo, with radium-233 dichloride in the lack of other treatment options. And the SPECT uh, that was done on the right was done in under 30 minutes, which for anyone who tried imaging radium-233 uh, is uh, it's a huge uh, 
improvement over standard imaging. And you would appreciate the high quality of these images, although, as I mentioned, they were done in under 30 minutes. But the thing that we're most excited about this year is the introduction of uh, StarGuide, this new design, Spec CT. Uh, and I want to take a moment here to acknowledge Nathan uh, Harmony, who has been a huge supporter of all things nuclear medicine for many decades, but also of CZT technology over more than a decade or so. Um, and uh, thank, I want to thank him for all his support in this field. This is how the scanner looks like. I want to uh, acknowledge the installation, the first installation worldwide with Professor Bailly in Orléans in France. Uh, but uh, we're uh, happy to have the camera installed at my institution as well. I'm going to show you a few examples uh, in the Terranostic space. We have others as well for another time. On the top, two field of views, two beds. This is much closer to PET than it is to SPEC, in my opinion. 10 minutes per bed, the same two beds reconstructed at 5 minutes per bed. I don't think you can tell the difference. So I think that we can go very fast. This is the camera that can image both energies of the lutetium-177. It's in, our institu in my institution across the hallway from the Theranostic space, so perfectly suited for post-treatment imaging for these patients. A different patient, also two beds, 10 minutes at the top row, five minutes at the bottom row. I don't think that you can tell the difference, uh, not for the purposes that we do this imaging. And then the same patient on the top, we have the uh, D670, uh, 12, 12 and a half minutes per field of view, and at the bottom, five minutes uh, per field of view from the star guide. So I think that we're only scratching the surface of what can be done with the star guide. We're learning every day uh, new things. Um, it uh, will probably be selectively used for indication where it's worthwhile. Um, I think that this is the next step uh, in spec CT technology and um, I look forward to learning more of what the camera can do. We only had it uh, operational for a few weeks. The next important thing in a successful Theranostic space is collaborations. And if you look at this graph, this shows the growth in the field of nuclear medicine in the global nuclear medicine market, expected through 2025, the largest growth is in the space of Theranostics. So each of us will have the opportunity to work with the industry, with each other, and only through such collaborations we'll be able to advance the field. Most importantly, it's collaborating with others. These are just some of my colleagues who deal with prostate cancer patients, so I want to acknowledge my colleagues in medical oncology on the top row, radiation oncology in the middle, and urology at the bottom. Research is a team sport, and you need to play well with each other and collaborate. That's the only way to be successful. And I'll spend the last few minutes talking about people. I want to acknowledge Gunila and Bean, who uh, lead our radiochemistry uh, you can see what a growth we've had from 2006 when we were making three radio pharmaceutical to currently when we have more than 30 INDs as well as a few others. And these are just some of the radio pharmaceuticals that uh, we produce in, in our facility. This was one of the busiest research day for us and i um, proud to say that uh, between commercial radio pharmacy but mostly produced on site, we were able to um, uh, scan all these participants. It's not every day like this, but uh, I saved it because it's truly an impressive result. We also give back to the community in the uh, almost one decade since we started uh, these programs. We scanned more than 750 patients with no cost to them. We covered the cost of all these examinations. I want to end by thanking uh, our technologists. Uh, nothing would be done without their enthusiastic support. Our residents, uh, we have the first in the United States combined radiology and nuclear medicine program. Uh, and looking at what our residents are doing, I wonder if I would have ever been admitted into a residency program. They're truly remarkable individuals. We structured our program over six years, and I think that this is plenty of time for them to learn both radiology and nuclear medicine and be both uh, certified by the American Board of Radiology, American Board of Nuclear Medicine. Many of our trainees in the preclinical and clinical space go back to their institutions and they take with them the knowledge, the friendships, and the collaboration. So the collaboration is the team here you will see between preclinical molecular imaging program at Stanford and clinical where our trainees and other faculty went back. And you will see that uh, they're all over the world and we look forward to being in touch with them. I want to thank my colleagues as well. Our group has grown over the years and uh, we are now a large group between the main hospital, the pediatric hospital, and the VA hospital. 
And I want to give a big shout out to our Theranostics Clinic uh, leads, Karina, Kat, Valentina, Corinne, Tina, and Elena. Uh, they do a great job uh, in this space, and we are, of course, all supporting them, making sure that they're successful. We all see patients with them. And I will end with some powerful um, words that Aruna, Sam's wife, said when we opened this space. She told us that Sam could have been a patient here. He could have benefited from this. And to think of every patient that comes through as if he could have been, he or she could have been Sam. So uh, this is a strong reminder for all of us when we enter this space. And also Sam's words, an unplanned journey. Uh, most of us did not plan to be in nuclear medicine, at least not me. Uh, but we love it, and uh, we should treat each other with respect, not just in our immediate family, but uh, all of us in the field. And this is how we will be remembered. And uh, I encourage all of you to, to keep these words uh, close to your mind. With that, thank you again for the invitation. Honor to be in your company. So, Professor Yaguru, thanks again for, for taking time to, to share your experience and expertise and the outcomes of your state-of-the-art uh, Theranostic Center with us. Absolutely, absolutely fantastic. And, and thanks to all of you who have joined, um, all of the uh, audience who have joined uh, remotely, thanks for your time uh, to uh, and attention that you've given to the speakers today. Um, you know, at, at G Healthcare, we are dedicated to uh, hopefully making your work easier, more productive and, uh, and more fulfilling. And, um, and that's why we've created this uh, session this is why we've created the experience at ENM. So look, please stop by the, the GE uh, virtual booth and, and take a look at some of the other products. Um, have a, a talk to some of the um, uh, uh, experts there. Some of them being involved in the development of those products as well as obviously the deployment. Um, so let me just conclude by saying on behalf of myself, uh, the speakers uh, and all of GE Healthcare, um, Thanks for your joining and uh, wish you a fantastic virtual Congress at EANN 21.